May it please the court. Care, custody, and control. These words are seen throughout Texas and United States Supreme Court case law to detail the fundamental rights that parents have in this country. We are here today asking this court to protect those due process constitutional rights. This case illustrates that a lifetime protective order against a parent as to her children acts as a de facto termination of parental rights without the constitutional protections of a termination proceeding. How is it like a termination when the parental rights are still there for pretty much all purposes other than what's set out in the protective order? So how is it a termination order? All of the rights related to care, custody, and control have been stripped away from Ms. Starry. She has retained no meaningful rights to participate in any way in the child rearing decisions or in the lives of her children. Isn't a modification possible if in fact her behavior were to improve? The problem here is with the process of getting to this point and the fact that there is a modification option available does not save it from the constitutional infirmities of this process. She has been stripped away completely of all the key fundamental rights of parents and on any modification in a protective order setting, the burden is going to be shifted to her. And now she has to prove and try to chip away and get back those rights, which she lost in a very flawed process to begin with. If we said go back and do it on clear and convincing as opposed to preponderance standard, would that be enough? It would not be enough. There are a number of constitutional infirmities in this process, and just implementing a clear and convincing evidence standard is not going to resolve those. What else do we need for a protective order? Are you saying we cannot do protective orders at all, or what else would you add? No, the concern here relates to a protective order over two years. Typically in Texas, protective orders are two years or less, and you can, a court may issue a protective order for longer, if it finds there was an allegation of a felony involving family violence, just an allegation. If you have a termination proceeding, you are going to have 12 to 18 months to conduct discovery. You are going to have the clear and convincing evidence standard. The most comparable provision of the termination statute under chapter 161 of the family code relates to you have to prove by clear and convincing evidence. Excuse me, are you saying that a protective order can be ordered simply upon an allegation of these heightened requirements? The two year or longer protective order is available if it is alleged that there has been family violence, something that would constitute a felony offense. It does not require serious bodily injury or death, which is required by the comparable termination statute. But it requires proof. Only by preponderance of the evidence. Right. Right, more, more than an allegation. There has to be yeah. a finding. So anyone who practices family not law knows that allegations of violence are rampant. We see them every day in family law cases. But, the but burden what we're getting at is that's not enough. Correct. There has to be evidence. There has to be proof, not a mere allegation. There has to be evidence by just a preponderance of the evidence standard. No, that's what's required upon proof, not the allegation. The preponderance of the evidence standard the court must find by preponderance of the evidence that the person committed a felony offense involving family violence. Correct. The preponderance of the evidence standard is part of the constitutional infirmity in this case. Um, the Texas or the United States Supreme Court has been clear that when you are going to terminate parental rights, you need a clear and convincing evidence standard. So would you say that if a parent is the one who is having the protective order entered against him or her, if it's longer than two years, it needs to be clear and convincing? Or if it's four years or eight years or what, where do we draw the line? Obviously, this case involves a lifetime protective order. Sure. But I believe that the constitutional infirmity lies with the statute that allows for a protective order longer than two years. The United States Supreme Court recently considered the case of Rahimi, which dealt with the constitutionality of civil protective orders in the context of firearms. And in that case, the United States Supreme Court, while they upheld the ability to restrict firearms in that case, they were very clear that it was only applying to the specific facts of that case. Rahimi's protective order was only two years. And the temporary nature of the protective order was critical 
in the determination of why they could strip those constitutional rights. So in this case, uh, apparently there was evidence that indicated that when the children were staying with the parent, she grabbed one of the children by the back of the head and beat his face on the hardwood floor. Is that right? So, Your Honor, I would encourage you to look at the record as a whole. And yes, if true, some of the facts alleged in this case are heinous. <coughs> However, if you look at the record as a whole, you will see that there were a number of due process violations that prevented Ms. Starry from putting on an adequate defense. Every but but uh, w with respect to other due process violations, like uh, I think you point out uh, not the unavail unavailability of a jury trial and discovery. Those are the two that I, I saw. Was there ever any uh, objection posed to going forward with a bench trial or any attempt to seek discovery that was declined by the trial court? So, so was this, were these two challenges preserved in the, in the trial court? So these two challenges are deficiencies in the statute. You are not entitled to a jury trial under the family code in a protective order proceeding. And the statutes require a quick trial. Depending on the county, we're looking at 14 to 20 days for a protective order. I use the term trial lightly. It's really a, a final hearing. There's no opportunity to conduct discovery when you're looking at that timeline. Was that argued in the trial court that that was a constitutional deficiency with the statute? It was not, but that does not constitute a waiver because you cannot waive your constitutional rights. Additionally, Ms. Starry... You can't waive your constitutional rights? I do not believe that a constitutional right in, in, in this nature can be waived. However, she was not on notice that a lifetime protective order was a possibility in this case because nobody even requested a lifetime protective order. The I did notice that, that uh, it seems to be that uh, it's totally up to the trial court from what the statute says in terms of if, if the trial court makes the findings for an over two year protective order, the judge can make it as long as he or she wants. Is that, because it says may. Correct, and the statute is very open-ended. Um, the ex-husband, when asked about it during his testimony, indicated he believed it should last until they reached the age of majority, and after that, the children could decide for themselves. Is there any precedent uh, that sets a standard of review for the May of how long it goes? Any court, courts of appeals that have said, uh, you know, what, what a court's supposed to consider in terms of how long it should be or reversed ones that are too long? I'm not aware of any precedent that specifically addressed that. The only other cases out there dealing with these types of issues were for protective orders that were not permanent in nature. No state Supreme Court anywhere that we could find has addressed the issue of a permanent protective order that impacts parental rights. But isn't it common that other states do have similar statutes? I don't know if there are similar statutes. Having I Having to do with protective orders? I'm sorry, what? Having to do with protective orders. There are certainly pr different protective order state, uh, statutes in different states, and I do not know what states have comparable protective orders. What I do know is that the most closely analogous case law from any state Supreme Courts or other jurisdictions out there relates to, they use the term guardianship in these other states, but it would be the equivalent to conservatorship here. And the courts in all of those cases did not find they violated constitutional rights because of the, par the parents were able to modify and terminate those guardianships at any time. There were no restrictions on their ability to do that. Here, even though the mother could technically modify, that's just to modify the terms. It's very limited what she could do. The statute only gives her two opportunities to try to vacate it. And at that time, the burden has shifted tremendously to her. She's been stripped of all of these key core constitutional rights, and now she has the burden in only two opportunities to vacate under the statute to try and get those back. The children could seek relief? The children could, but the ability of the children to seek relief does not in any way impact the mother's, the constitutional violation against the mother in this case. How do we think about um, a situation where you have a protective order and then potentially either a criminal conviction where, uh, under a higher burden of proof, other standard, standard of proof, or a termination proceeding where the state actually comes in um, and, and meets the burden for establishing termination. How does that impact the protective order? Does it, does it have a curative effect? Does it, is it irrelevant? How should we think about that? So 
Our position is that the solution to the constitutional infirmities of this statute are to require the clear and convincing evidence standard of a termination proceeding and to require a conviction for felony violence, family violence involving serious death or bodily injury or uh, community supervision. Do, the reason we, for those- Do we require a, a conviction in connection with the termination of parental rights? In other words, doesn't endangerment alone uh, constitute grounds for termination? You don't have to prove um, a final conviction. The most comparable ground based on the facts of this case for a termination proceeding would be under subsection L, and that relates to a conviction. Whether or not there are other grounds that could have been alleged, there might be. There are, I believe, 25 different grounds for involuntary termination of parental rights. But in a termination proceeding, that is a whole different ballgame from what happened here. Usually those cases are gonna take 12 to 18 months. You're gonna do discovery. You're gonna have an opportunity to put on a complete defense. Your criminal case, most people, or many people who have a protective order have a criminal case pending in those 14 to 20 days when they have to have a hearing. Isn't your argument really protecting the parent ever over the rights of the child not to be harmed? No, Your Honor, there has to be a balancing act here. And there are other constitutional mechanisms for protecting children and other victims of domestic violence without this statute. A lifetime protective order is not necessary to protect children from imminent danger. We have temporary protective order, we have injunctions and steps or proceedings, bond conditions if someone is on, under criminal <coughs> indictment. There are a lot of constitutional, constitutionally tested processes that could have been used in this case and could be used in this case if this court vacates the protective order if it is appropriate, which I do not believe the facts support that, but I realize this court must look at precedent for all protective order cases and you will have a concern for the safety of victims as we all do. That does not negate the constitutional rights of parents and they must be protected. I see that my time is up. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Draper. Ms. Guzman, we'll hear from you. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Termination of parental rights has been described as the death penalty of civil cases. And that description fits because what's at stake is the fundamental liberty interest in the care, in the custody, in the control of our children. The lifetime protective order here raises serious and critical constitutional questions because it effectively terminated parental rights without the safeguards of a termination proceeding. One is not a substitute for the other. Even if, I, I wonder if it's even worse than termination because if your rights are terminated in a, in a conventional parental termination proceeding, you, your legal right to the children is extinguished, but you can still write them a letter. As or, just, or, or say hello to them at the grocery store, or, which, which she, can't, she can't even do that. Let's mis make no mistake, and that's exactly right, Justice Blacklock. This order is permanent, and it's forever. And Justice Ferris noted in her dissent that this is worse than a termination order because even when these children turn 18, they can't see their mother if they want to because their mother may face criminal prosecution. A parent's fundamental liberty interest in her children doesn't vanish when she faces serious allegations of abuse and investigation, or even when those familial bonds are weakened. Well, there was more than allegations of abuse here. She was indicted for uh, injury to a child, and uh, there was testimony that the trial court believed and it had to believe in making a finding that a felony had occurred. So if we agree with you that uh, there's a higher evidentiary standard that should apply because of the rights that are at stake, what do we do for purposes of resolving this case? Should it be remanded to the trial court for a new trial? Should uh, an appellate court endeavor to review the record under a clear and convincing evidence standard and, and determine if there's enough evidence to meet that standard? What, what should we do? 
This court should remand this case after it reviews the record and is convinced, if, assuming the court adopts the clear and convincing standard, that this trial court formed a firm conviction and belief in the allegations. She didn't allow an offer of proof. She limited cross-examination. She didn't allow a witness to testify about Mr. Etheridge's own uh, violence. That goes to credibility. The question here is not whether a lifetime protective order is ever available in any case. Certainly in the boyfriend dating relationships, those are available. They shouldn't be subject to the same scrutiny. But the parent-child relationship, that's fundamental. The question here is what process is a parent entitled to before there is a deprivation of parental rights, whether it's through a termination order, as it should be. If it's that bad, they have a constitutional option. Instead of a lifetime protective order, go file a termination. That's a constitutionally tested process. As the majority said in Santosky versus Kramer, it can't be that to terminate parental rights or to effectively terminate them, as Justice Ferris noted in her dissent, the standard is the same as for awarding money damages. Would the constitutional issue be, or analysis be different if this order, instead of saying permanent duration, said duration of 10 years? The, the question for me is, is there a permanent deprivation of okay. parental rights. Ten, ten years wouldn't be permanent, so you would concede that there's not a constitutional due process violation if it was ten years? No, I don't concede that, Justice Boyd. A firm conviction or belief, ten years, if all the stars align in those ten years, I may get my rights back. I don't think this idea that you can modify, if that's where we're going with this, is sufficient to cure the initial constitutional I'm, deficiency. I'm, I'm going with, I'm trying to figure out what, what I'm hearing from the petitioner side here is because it's permanent, you have to have extra protections constitutionally. And of course, then you, but, but two years you don't. And now you're gonna get into that spectrum. Okay, what about 10 years? What about nine and a half years? What about nine years? When does it become constitutionally significant? This is a due process question. What process is a parent entitled to? A temporary order doesn't raise the same constitutional concerns. A 10-year order does. So it's not temporal. It's what is the deprivation. If the deprivation is you can't see your children for 10 years, you can't go within 100 feet of them, you can't communicate them, you can't communicate with them, there is a counselor somewhere out there that's going to decide whether in that 10-year period, that's a lifetime for a child. But if it's only two years, then it's not a constitutional problem? I believe any time you're dealing with a fundamental right. So two months would be a constitutional problem? There are constitutional avenues for these two-month periods or these two two-year periods. They are temporary injunctions. They're issued all the time in family law cases. There are um, restraining orders that could be issued temporarily for the two months until there's an opportunity to assess and evaluate whether this deprivation impacts the fundamental right to care, custody, and control. That's what's at issue here. In a termination, there are service plans that you sometimes go through before your rights are terminated. There are permanency hearings. And the, whatever order comes out of that trial court is, is against the backdrop of a constitutional standard of proof. I see that my time is up. Any other questions? I, I want to make sure I understand what would happen on remand in your view. Would it be a remand for them to pursue termination only? Would it, if they want a lifetime protective order, can they do it just by having clear and convincing evidence and then the opportunity to put on the, the, the witnesses? What exactly on remand should happen? So that's a multifaceted question. The, the issue on remand would be under a clear and convincing lens, do these allegations, some of the, the records in, in the file, constitute a level of abuse that would constitutionally justify 
a termination. I don't think a protective order should ever be used to terminate parental rights. I think that those cases need to go back. Yes, it's a temporary and necessary uh, instrument. You have to protect the kids. But if you want to take away a parent's right to forever see their, forever, worse than a termination, <clears throat> that needs to be done in a different proceeding. I don't believe just the standard requiring the trial court to have a firm conviction and belief about what she sees is enough in these cases. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Guzman. We'll hear from the amicus in support of the Court of Appeals. May it please the Court, Mr. Bowen will present argument for the amicus. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. I want to start by thanking the Court for the opportunity to provide briefing and oral argument on the significant issues presented in this case. The Court of Appeals did not err in affirming the trial court's entry of a permanent protective order against Petitioner in this case based on the voluminous evidence at trial of mother's extensive abuse of her children, including abuse that was charged as a felony. The Court of Appeals also correctly concluded, based on the statutory framework of the Family Code, that a proceeding for a permanent protective order such as this, which again is subject to multiple avenues of modification, is not tan tantamount to parental termination such that the court should have applied clear and convincing evidence. So as a preliminary matter, I just want to make sure I understand that argument is that this is not a functional equivalent of parental termination. And for that reason, it was okay. But do you agree at least that if it were, if something may be different from this, but if there were something that was a functional equivalent of a parental termination, then that thing would have to at least satisfy clear and convincing evidence and perhaps a higher burden even than that. Yes, I think that's right. And I think, but I think to answer that question, we have to look at both the nature of the proceeding and the permanency of that proceeding. So that, that, that question then gets to, well, is this a functional equivalent? But if it is, if it is then, then, yes. then I think you'd have to go back to the beginning of in Santosky and this court's uh, opinion in GM and then look at the, the, the background of how the, how the courts have required clear and convincing evidence in termination proceedings. But in this case, under the <clears throat> Family Violence Protective Order statute in Texas, it is not equivalent to, to parental termination such that preponderance of the evidence is constitutionally permissible. Do you, do you know or does the record indicate why termination was not filed in this case? I don't think the record does indicate, Your Honor, why. There, CPS was involved on a number of or contacted a number they of times. They had been involved in the or, or they were contacted. They never uh, intervened as far as I the thought record. the mother was cleared in some other, that, that abuse was ruled out in some yeah, other there, interventions of CPS. There was testimony that um, CPS ruled out interventions, but I'm not, it, it wasn't entirely clear in my reading of the record whether that was on all the instances or just on some of the instances. Um, Are you arguing that the mother got due process? Yes, I think I think the Court of Appeals correctly concluded that under the Chapter 85.025 protective order that the trial court was not required to apply a clear and convincing evidence standard. And I think that is the quintessential, to kind of crystallize the issue for the court, the, the question before the court, I think that the mother has presented to the court, is whether this requirement of clear and convincing evidence is is necessary under Chapter 85.025. I, I think some of these ancillary due process arguments that are being raised were not properly preserved. I think the question before the court is whether in a lifetime protective order proceeding. Well, this was not a lifetime protective order proceeding, right? The, did the mother know at the time that all this was being discussed that it was going to be a lifetime order? It is interesting because if you look at the original protective order that was filed, it did not, it did not seek a lifetime. So it's unclear in the record how we got from the initial uh, protective order draft to the final order that was a lifetime. So she didn't have notice that it could be, a, well, I suppose anybody, it, anytime you show up in court, it could be a lifetime protective order because the statute is so general, but. Yeah, the statute just says if it exceeds more than two years. And, and it just says may, and there are no other parameters. Are, are you familiar with any cases that have fleshed that out, that have said when it would be an abuse of discretion to issue an order longer than a certain amount of time? Um, not specifically on, on those contours of, of the timing. I think the question in this case is, is 
whether a lifetime protective order, or, a, or better put, permanent protective order subject to modification, um, and, and whether that protective order amounts to parental termination such that a higher evidentiary standard should have applied. If the parties are arguing about a, a temporary protective order and the judge takes it under advisement and then comes back out and enters a lifetime protective order that nobody argued for and nobody knew they needed to argue against, is that a, a due process problem? Is that a notice, a lack of notice of, the, of what's at stake to the defendant? I think under chapter, this is on, uh, in my oral argument exhibit packet, page four, I have the excerpt from uh, section 85.025, and it says the court may render a protective order that is effective for a period that exceeds two years if the court finds that the person committed an act constituting felony offense involving family violence. So I don't think, the statute doesn't tie that to a notice requirement on the at the pleading stage. So I think that under the statute, a trial court could enter a lifetime protective order uh, if it makes the right. Do you think there's a constitutional finding. infirmity in that regime that empowers the court to issue a much harsher sanction than anybody's arguing for and, that, uh, and harsher than the defendant is on notice that she might be subject to? Speaking just in terms of lifetime protective orders or, or as they relate to the parent-child context or just generally? What? I suppose you can make it, it's, it's much more acute in the context of parental yeah. rights, but you could make the point more generally that uh, you know, people are entitled to know what's at stake when they go in to argue before a judge. And uh, if, if one side's arguing for X and I'm, I'm arguing against X and the judge comes back out with Y and I had no idea I needed to defend against that, that, that doesn't sound fair to most people's ears. I wonder whether that, that might be a due process problem. I don't think so because I think because the statute speaks of more than two years without any end, and if that's how the protective order proceeding was set up, that we were seeking a protective order that exceeded two years, then I think due process is satisfied. Do you know if there are these similar types of protective order proceedings in other states? There are, uh, and, and it's sort of a mixed bag in other states. A couple states have, have held that this is de facto parental termination, and one or two states have held that it's not. So it's not, in, but the, the challenge with looking at other states, um, which is why I didn't include these cases in the briefing, is that their statutes are so unique that the kind of procedural mechanisms don't align nicely. How are they hard. different? How are they different? Uh, some of them deal with, with the type of conduct that can um, lead to a protective order. There's unique, like, Doesn't neglect. That, that ours does that too, right? That's true, but I think, um, in when I was reading these other cases, and I'm happy to provide them in a letter brief if the court would like, but I felt I found them to not be as applicable to our specific statutory regime here. Are there any that allow lifetime protective orders against parents? Any other states statutes? I believe that the Vermont. I think I believe Vermont has a. Or, or there are supreme. Their courts have construed this as permissible. Leaving aside the, the due process concept for a second, just in, in, a, in an ordinary case, uh, is it an abuse of discretion for a trial court to grant more relief than anyone asked for? I don't believe so. Uh, I mean, I think in, in the protective order context under this statute, because the protective order authorizes a, uh, the statute authorizes a protective order that exceeds two years, and the protective order that was sought was exceeding two years. Well, I, I mean, you might have a, a proceeding where an amount of damages is authorized up to a million dollars, but you don't get a million dollars if you don't prove it or ask for it. And usually we deal with that through the adversary system where we say, you know, unless somebody's arguing for it, the judge can't give it. Right. And so I think in this context, uh, because, the, I mean, the trial court entered findings that it found that that the petitioner had committed family violence that rose to the level of a felony, and so therefore it was entitled to enter uh, a protective order that exceeded two years in duration. I, I think it's, uh, we have some cases that say, yes, you may be statutorily entitled to do that in a case where it's requested, but if it's not asked for, is that, it, it seems like that's an adversary system problem. Yeah, I potentially would agree to that, that that, that if, that if it isn't sought, but I think... Because then the judge is basically putting themselves in the shoes of the advocate. Right, but I think, it, I think again, here, as long as the 
as the party seeking the protective order, has sought a protective order that goes beyond two years and has put forth evidence to make that threshold statutory requirement of a, of a felony offense constituting family violence, then I think, I, think the stat, I think the trial court is within its discretion to enter a protective order within the statutory time frame. So there's no limit on that discretion. It can be however long you want. As well, long I think we could look at the. That. I think we could look at the. I think we could review the trial court's decision. The court could review the tri trial court's discretion based on the evidence under a under a legal sufficiency challenge. So I think you would still get to review I'm the evidence. I'm trying to figure out if there's an alternative here because this is about protection, and in this particular case, is protection of the children. And so let's say if a termination proceeding had been brought and uh, the court were to have found that a ground plus best interest had been proven by clear and convincing, and let's say this mother's parental rights were terminated, would the protective function that we're talking about, would that still be in play? How would that work in terms of protecting the children? And I think this gets to the essence of why the, statu why the legislature decided to enact uh, Chapter 85.025. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. What is and, and I think the, the point of the protective order is to protect individuals, children, uh, victims of domestic violence, a whole host of people from their abuser on a short order time frame. Could and a termination do that, a termination order? A termination order could restrict access, but it doesn't necessarily restrict access. So this fills a gap, or, or maybe not a gap, but serves a different purpose than a termination order. Because again, it only touches the right of access of the parent to the children to be around the children for as long as the protective order remains in place. I think this is again where the uniqueness of a family violence protective order is distinct from parental termination because it can be modified essentially in perpetuity. It can be modified by the person against who it's sought twice, so the mother here can move to modify it twice. And then this is on uh, bullet point five on page four of my OA packet. On the motion of any party, the court may modify an existing protective order to exclude any item included in the order. So any of the children, the dad, any party to the protective order proceeding can modify so that order. So let's say if, if, if a parent's parental rights were terminated, and let's say uh, an aunt adopted the children, okay? Um, typically those rights are severed forever, and now this adoptive parent is, plays the role of a parent for all purposes. Could an order be entered at that point in time that would protect the children from being allowed to be with the mother? Yes. I think the protective order can be entered against any person to protect any victim. No, I'm saying if it wasn't a protective order, if it was if the rights to the mother were terminated, these other part this other party <laughs> adopted and there was concern that this party was going to allow the children to be with the mother and the mother let's say if evidence was proven, or if it was proven that that mother would endanger the child, then what type of protective orders would be possible at that time, or what type of protection through that avenue of termination as opposed to a protective order? Oh, through the, I'm not sure there would be an avenue through termination for that protection. I mean, that's what that I'm point. asking. Yeah, I think, the, I think the answer would be a protective order in that situation to protect if, the children. If we ultimately conclude that the nature of uh, the protection afforded to the victims here uh, was tantamount to termination of the parents' rights. Uh, and so worthy of the application of a clear and convincing evidence standard, what is the appropriate remedy? Should we remand for a new trial uh, for, a, for a determination under that higher evidentiary threshold? Yes, I think if the court concludes that clear and convincing evidence should have been applied here, I think it should be remanded for a new trial under clear and convincing evidence because of Supreme Court and I think this court's authority too saying that the litigants have the right to know at the beginning of trial what the burden of proof is and how that burden is allocated. I wonder if you could help us walk through the Santosky analysis yeah, be uh, because there are, there are three parts that the court looked at there to decide whether there's clear and convincing evidence that's required and the first one is uh, the nature of the right impaired, uh, that the private interest affected. Uh, and uh, so it, would it or wouldn't it be enough on that 
part of the test that uh, you're depriving the parent of companionship, care, and custody, maybe even, maybe not quite completely control, as you point out, but certainly companionship, care, and custody. Uh, would that rise to the level under Santosky of a grave impairment, uh, even if there's some control that's still impaired, that's still allowed? No, I don't believe so, because in, uh, in applying the Eldridge factors in Santosky, the United States Supreme Court explained that whether the loss threatened by a particular proceeding is sufficiently grave to warrant more than average certainty on the part of the fact, fact finder, i.e., preponderance, turns on both the nature of the private interest threatened and the permanency of the threatened loss. And so, well, it's permanent here. We know that. And the nature is uh, that the, the loss of companionship, care, and custody. So why is that not sufficiently grave? But I don't, I disagree that it's permanent here because of the multiple avenues for modification that including in the protective order itself that specifically contemplates modification. And so I think that, that it's not the same as termination where you have one appellate right and then you, then it's over and there's no modification. Whereas here, but Santosky recognizes that there are also some rights that can fall in that bucket that are not, uh, that are not, that, that can be revisited like uh, deportation and there were some others, I think. Yeah, and, and I think, but I think that, this, that Santosky's talk, discussion about the state seeking to not merely infringe on a fundamental, fundamental liberty interest, but to end it, is what distinguishes that analysis in Santosky from here, where we're not extinguishing anything in a protective order. We're prohibiting the, the person from seeing their children for as long as the protective order remains in place. And let that's- me, Let me ask you about the second factor, the risk of error from the standard and the likelihood that a higher standard would reduce it. It seems like the risk of error is quite high here because you have these very vague May standards. Uh, and, and that was the concern in Santosky as well, is that you have these very, these very vague standards that are um, uh, susceptible to, uh, it, you know, difficult for the court to apply and, and uh, could, could lead to different kinds of outcomes. And so if you've got a May standard and there's really no guidance for the trial court on how long this should last, that, isn't that the same kind of problem we had in Santosky? No, I don't think so, because in that, in the application of the second factor in Santosky, the court also talked about the balancing of the safety of the child against the parent's ability, uh, excuse me, against the state's interest in going after that. So that's the third factor. Right, but, but I'm sorry, but they, it, the court also talked about allocating the risk in, in the second factor analysis. And here I think that risk is adequately allocated because the trial court has no discretion to keep the protective order in place if it finds that it's no longer warranted. That's uh, in, the fa in the chapter 85 of the family code. Well, there won't ever be such a finding unless, uh, unless somebody requests it, I guess, but it's permanent by its nature, so. Right, but, but the fact that any person who's a party to the protective order proceeding or mother can move to modify it, and then upon that motion to modify, the trial court must modify it if it finds that there's no continuing need for the protective order. I think that distinguishes this scenario from a parental termination. So that, that seems more like the first factor. I guess what, what I'm getting at is that the, what, what the Santosky court said on that second risk of error factor is there are imprecise subjective standards that have a lot of discretion built in and it, it just seems like that's what we've got here. And I think there is once a, you're beyond two I think, years. Yeah, I think there is a lot of discretion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. If the mother had been convicted of the third degree felony she was charged with, do you have a sense of what a likely sentence would have been? On a third degree felony? She, she, I think she was indicted on it a third, third degree, degree I think that's five to... It might be a little less than that, but it, yeah. just, let's say it's a few years. Yeah. Um, a question that is occurring to me as a parent is would I rather go to prison for two or three years or would I rather be prohibited for life from contacting or being near my children? Uh, and the answer to me is clearly I'd rather go to prison for two or three years. Uh, we have all of these elaborate doctrines of constitutional law that have been developed to protect people's liberty interests when they're at risk of uh, being locked up for committing crimes. Uh, and I wonder whether at the end of the day the, the kind of what's been done to this woman, whether she deserved it or not, uh, is actually far worse than that is, and is a, a greater intrusion on her liberty than would be a 
prison sentence. I agree with the with the premise that being in prison for a couple of years is is far better than never seeing your children again. I think that the the difference in this context is that the protective order itself specifically contemplated reunification between mother and her children. It it said quote, that the children are to remain in counseling with a counselor that fits the needs of each child, and that the counselor for each child shall specifically consider whether and when the child is ready to begin reunification. So I think the protective order even went beyond the statutory rights for modification and contemplated a, another avenue for, for, reuni for reuniting mother and her children in this Let case. Let me just ask you this. I mean, we're not contemplating that there would be no way that a protective order could be granted in this type of situation. We're talking about simply heightening what's required to get it, say, for example, by needing to prove by clear and convincing evidence. What's the downside of that? The downside is that the legislature made the very specific policy decision to permit protective orders such as this under the family code subject to a preponderance of the evidence standard on a short time window to protect victims of domestic violence from their abusers. And so uh, heightening that burden uh, would interfere with with the legislature's decision to enact this statutory to protect regime. for a short time is one thing to have a permanent order with, you know, I guess this possibility that who knows, maybe one day when the children are 64, it will be modified. Doesn't seem like that has any congruence with a judgment that for a short time to protect people, we need to have a lower standard. And we're talking about now a permanent order. On its face, it's permanent. I get your, your point. You're doing a, a very able job as an appointed amicus. I'm grateful for it. But that is not the same thing as actually saying that it isn't permanent because it might one day be changed. It's permanent on its face. Until something happens otherwise, it's permanent. That doesn't have anything to do with protecting someone on a short term. Right, and I think what I meant in the short term was just in the two-week period to get the protective order at the very beginning. And then moving into the how long the court can enter the protective order, the legislature made the decision to allow these to last in perpetuity, but only under the circumstances in which a person is found to have committed felony level family violence. So it's not, it's not any circumstance can you get a longer protective order. It's reserved for those instances in which the person So the, the, the statute covers all measure of of family violence, the clear and convincing evidence standard that applies to parental termination was added by the legislature because this court concluded that the Constitution required it. Right. And so if we're talking about that very specific kind of familial relationship, uh, dating relationships are not protected by the Constitution in any particular way, but the parent-child relationship is a fundamental constitutional right. So would not the doctrine of constitutional avoidance at the very least suggest that for a protective order when it comes to parents and that goes beyond the what, what seems like well there's a two-year expectation and then under extreme circumstances it can go beyond that <clears throat> at the very least for that circumstance and for the parent-child relationship would it not actually be a, a continuation of this court's precedent to say no the constitution still applies even if you label it as a protective order uh, and then you add to that the due process clause, you have a double reason for constitutional avoidance. And then if the legislature really, really, really wants to say, no, we can take children away from their parents on a preponderance of the evidence for the rest of both of their lives, it can pass a law that says that, and then we can address the constitutionality of that statute if the legislature really wants that. I think that that in looking at how this court and the United States Supreme Court got to the decision that clear and convincing evidence was required, and this court's many subsequent opinions talking about termination, nearly always discussing this is terminating every right permanently forever. And here, mother retains many rights from the final divorce decree. I've included a chart in my briefing. Um, the about right to be consulted about dental care. I mean, I, I get that. I understand. There's not nothing, but compared to seeing your child ever again for the rest of your life, I, I mean, I'm, I'd be glad to hear from my child's dentist. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, but when we're speaking in terms, of, this court has talked about the bundle, sh the bundle of conservatorship rights, and we're t we're touching some of those rights. 
we have to still look at the remaining rights that are left unaffected by a protective order when we're speaking about the constitutional requirements on a protective order proceeding versus a termination proceeding. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Bowen, and thank you for your willingness to accept the assignment. Thank you. Ms. Draper, you have five minutes. May it please the court. As Justice Ferris stated in her dissent, a limited opportunity to later seek review of a continuing need for a lifetime protective order does not make a fundamentally unfair proceeding comport with due process. I want to address an issue uh, that Justice Learman raised about uh, the protective nature. What do you, if you have a termination proceeding, how do you then guarantee protection of the children? If there had been a termination proceeding here, it would be much more appropriate to issue a protective order because the due process rights were protected by the termination proceeding. That termination order could include injunctions against the mother from seeing the children if it had been issued, but if it is believed that more serious protections are necessary, not coming within 500 feet of the school or whatever the case may be, we would not have the same constitutional concerns that we have here. Justice Busby, you mentioned about the risk of error. I agree that the risk of error is extremely high and it goes beyond just the, the May language. The preponderance of the evidence standard and lack of a jury trial here, the risk of error is tremendous. The record as a whole, if we look at all the due process concerns within this record, this woman was not allowed to really mount a defense based on the record that we have here. A lot of well, she waived her Fifth Amendment right and testified on her own behalf and said these allegations are simply not true. That is true. However, the trial court hamstrung her at every step of the way from putting on a proper defense in this case. And as a result, it has now been four and a half years since she has seen or spoken to her children. There was not a criminal conviction then, and public records show us there is not a criminal conviction now. But we have this protective order, and the burden has been shifted to require her to prove that it is no longer necessary. How is she going to do that in the shoes that she is in in this case? The process was fundamentally flawed. That is where her constitutional rights were violated. The trial court used the lowest burden of proof to grant the most extreme remedy. It is like, it is like she was charged with assault and walked out convicted of murder. The legislature's decision to issue a preponderance of the evidence standard in this case does not make it per se constitutional. And there are so many constitutional infirmities here that really need to be addressed. I, I understand that you've pointed out and Amiki have pointed out multiple constitutional infirmities. But the only one that the Court of Appeals looked at was the clear and convincing evidence standard. And squinting, we can potentially see that in the trial record. But any, any of these others were not pointed out to the trial court and not argued in the Court of Appeals. There what were other we constitutional that? informities argued in the Court of Appeals. There were, the first two points of error were the preponderance of the evidence standard and then the allegation of a felony without the protections of a criminal proceeding. Here, she did not have the benefit of the Fifth Amendment in a, crim in a criminal case. She can plead the Fifth and the court cannot hold it against her. If she had chosen to plead the Fifth in this case, the trial court could have assumed everything she said would have been bad. She had no choice but to waive the Fifth Amendment in that case. Were you gonna say something else? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, we, and we also raised, you know, there's no, the, the short timeline, we raised the, I know the lack of a jury trial was raised. We raised the issue of the failure to offer a burden, uh, to allow her to do a burden of proof. We actually had four issues in total. One of them was sufficiency of the evidence, and we addressed the various issues with what happened in the trial court and those arguments. I know the constitutional issues are the big ones that we're here to talk about today. We are requesting that this protective order be vacated. It has been four and a half years 
since this woman has seen her children. One of the children is now 19 years old and an adult. The process as a whole was wholly deficient, and there are constitutional means to obtain additional protection if that order is vacated. If the father believes that a protective order is necessary, he has every right to go seek an additional protective order under the standard that this court sets forth. There is no statute of limitations on when you can do that. A remand is not necessary. It should be vacated. There's also the modification proceeding related to the children that are still not of majority yet, and protections can be had in that realm. If the father believes a termination is warranted under any ground under the family code, then he is certainly able to go seek that termination under whatever grounds he believes that he can prove. But at the end of the day, this was unconstitutional, and we are asking this court to vacate the protective order and find that you need both a clear and convincing evidence standard and a conviction or deferred adjudication of a crime involving family violence with serious bodily injury or death. I see that my time is up. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Draper. The case is submitted. The court is pleased to have been able to conduct oral arguments here at the University of Houston Law Center, and we will enjoy interacting with you uh, uh, in the uh, rest of the morning. The marshal will adjourn the court. All right.